from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Today's event is uh, uh, sponsored by Science, Technology, and Business Division. And uh, today we were going to have uh, Dr. Billington, librarian of Congress, for the uh, welcome remark, but uh, he unfortunately couldn't make it. But we are very fortunate to have Deputy Librarian of Congress, Mr. Dyser. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, it is a, a real pleasure for me on behalf of all of my colleagues at the library to welcome our panelists and all our guests here um, today for this program this morning. Um, this library, the Library of Congress, is very much um, Congress's library. We um, assist members and committees every day here uh, in their legislative responsibilities, even during shutdowns. We're, we're here. Um, doing that, but it's also, uh, the Library of Congress is also the, the nation's library. We uh, are, this is the place where the record of America is kept. Um, it's, it's history, it's achievements, it's advancements, and that includes uh, its scientific advancement. It's, it's, and it's a particular pleasure for us, it's really an honor for us to be able to welcome people here at the library who've made such uh, significant uh, contributions to that uh, record of uh, scientific advancement. Our um, collections of, of scientific material here at the library probably can be uh, traced right back to 1815 when uh, Congress purchased Thomas Jefferson's library as a way to uh, restore their library, which had been burnt the year before when the Capitol was burned. And the reason why that was so significant was really in one act, you went from a library that was about 3,000 volumes that was pretty much a legal, economic, historical works library to a library that was universal, that collected in the arts, in the sciences, in foreign languages. Jefferson probably had the best personal library at that time. Um, the story goes that he was, in, in order to raise some money, he was trying to decide whether to sell his library or his wine collection, and we're glad he decided on the library. Um, but that expanded the congressional library really into what, what would become uh, the nation's library. So even since that time, our collections in the sciences have continued to grow it's to one of the largest and most diversified uh, collections in the world. It is um, looked over and uh, continue to be built and preserved and, and served by a staff that uh, is uh, very knowledgeable and committed um, to those collections and is particularly enthusiastic. I, I would point this staff out uh, among all of our staffs as being particularly enthusiastic about sharing their collections and providing opportunities for people to learn more about the sciences. So I think this, is, uh, this event this morning is one, ex one more example of that. So we're um, happy, very happy to have our panel here and, and our guests and um, I will turn it back to Tomoko's and we'll get the program started. Thank you again, welcome. So today's topic is translational medicine and we have a wonderful uh, moderator to uh, organize this panel. And uh, let me introduce uh, our moderator, Dr. Ola Smith. She's a managing editor for the uh, Science Translational Medicine. It's a new journal, and she can explain about journal as well as about the uh, what is translational medicine means. But she is actually uh, moved from the cell to uh, translational medicine. She's, she has a medical degree as well from England, and uh, she went to a Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine at the University of London. So she has a broad uh, background with a biochemistry to medicine, so a perfect person. So before further ado, Dr. Smith. 
Well, thank you very much, Tomoko. It really is great to be here and to see such a great crowd. And I'm really excited about our three panelists who I'll shortly be introducing. So what is translational medicine? So simply put, translational medicine is translating the exciting advances and discoveries uh, of research at the bench into new treatments and cures for patients at the bedside. And we need both basic and applied research in order to be able to drive innovation and discoveries and new treatments for the patients who really need them. And one of the big goals today is to, is to think about how we can speed up this process. And the discovery of the structure of DNA 60 years ago um, by Dr. Watson, who's with us today, Dr. Crick and, uh, Crick and uh, Morris Wilkins, has found many applications in the clinic, culminating today with genome sequencing, where patients are having their genome sequence, and it's helping to inform uh, their treatment and deciding which uh, drugs that they're going to be treated with. So uh, we have a very distinguished panel today, um, and I'd like to perhaps invite them to uh, come up, and then I can introduce them, and then we can get started with the program. So I think our, our first panelist, uh, Dr. Jim Watson, doesn't need any introduction at all. Uh, Dr. Watson is Chancellor Emeritus of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, and as we all know, in 1962, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of the structure of DNA, which was 60 years ago um, this year, along with uh, Dr. Francis Crick and Dr. Morris Wilkins. Our next panelist is Dr. Carol Greider, who is the Daniel Nathans Professor and Director of Molecular Biology and Genetics at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institution. And Dr. Greider received the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of telomeres and the enzyme telomerase, which protect the ends of chromosomes. And she received the prize along with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn and Dr. Jack Sostak. And our final panelist is Dr. Elliot Crook, who is Professor and Chair of the Department of Biochemistry, Molecular and Cell Biology at Georgetown University Medical Center. And Dr. Crook's research focuses on um, cell cycle control of chromosomal DNA replication, and also um, a new uh, avenue of research in his lab is cellular responses to environmental stress. So I'd like, to, uh, like you all to welcome our panel. So I'm first going to ask the panel one by one what the term translational medicine means to them and how they think their work has contributed to moving translational medicine forward. So perhaps, Dr. Watson, would you like to start us off? What, what? Well, I, I think it obviously means uh, uh, something which can be uh, applied to, uh, to, to benefit human existence. Uh, whether in medicine or in uh, criminal justice or uh, a whole variety of things. So uh, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it sounds pretty obvious. Sort of, the day we found the double helix, we didn't think it was about its translational consequences. And uh, um, we just wanted to know how DNA worked. And then with time, it, it was only with the arrival of uh, recombinant DNA 20 years ago that uh, you could immediately, you know, you could have a gene. It began to, you know, words like gene therapy suddenly appeared. So it, it was 20 years sort of in pure science. And then uh, uh, the translational thing, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, pure science is sort of a, in, in a sort of, you know, in a snob way, look down on translational people. And, uh, but in fact, if you look, you know, and try to foresee this future of this century, what is going to be really happen? Is it going to be in pure science or translational? I bet my bet on translational. And uh, I'm a little scared when, uh, they want a big, big building and say it's only pure science. I, I, I'm scared of pure science getting rather pedantic and boring. Whereas the... Uh, <laughs> I think there's no danger of pure science becoming boring. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, 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 I'm just saying... Uh, 
stopping Alzheimer's is more important by any way you look at it than discovering a new subunit of RNA polymerase one. So, you know, you, you have to put it in perspective. You know, are you going to be a hero if you stop Alzheimer's? Yes, you'll be on a snap. If you find a new subunit of RNA polymerase one, and there, you know, thank, how thank you, you count. It's, uh, you know, maybe you, you, you'll be lucky if you're included in your institution's annual report. <laughs> <laughs> so, to follow up on that, I mean, I, I think that there is a, um, a very good relationship between basic science and, and translational science. Um, I also started off as really a fundamental um, researcher, just uh, curiosity-driven science, trying to understand how telomeres, the ends of chromosomes, were maintained. It was actually uh, Jim Watson's paper that set, off, set us off um, looking for how do you uh, maintain the ends of chromosomes um, from a, a theoretical paper that he wrote in 1973. Um, and it really was a curiosity-driven question. It was really basic science. Uh, but then by continuing to follow our curiosity, of course it's going to be interesting what the implications are. Um, and so um, I, I, I often like to say that um, uh, you know, there's uh, basic science and then translational science, and you need to have that, um, that spring of basic science, because if you don't have all of those um, thoughts coming up, there's nothing to translate. So the two are really interdependent. Um, and uh, the translational uh, science has the opportunity then to um, uh, have uh, therapeutics and, um, and that kinds of thing. So I think that you, know, you really need both. Today people talk about, you know, should we put our emphasis on translational science or on basic science? And the answer is, of course, you have to do both. You have to have the fundamental, you have to understand what the polymerase subunit is in order to be able to do the science later on. So they build on each other. And I think that that interdependence is what is, um, is important. And I certainly have found a lot of satisfaction in seeing some of the things that we've done actually um, help patients. And Dr. Kirk? Um, I'd sit there and the introduction you gave about translational science I thought was accurate, but I would add to that, it's not only bench to bedside, but from the bedside back to the bench. because. You're doing the basic science research. I was trained as a, a classic enzymologist, and part of it is a passion to understand you know, a fundamental biochemical, cellular, physiologic process, and you're doing it just for the, the sake of knowledge. But it's, sometimes what's, when, when you see that it can have implications in the delivery of medicine, uh, you know, that's rewarding. And often what happens now is coming from the patient through the clinician back to the basic scientist asking, you know, what's the molecular underlying you know, uh, pathologies going on, you get that idea of translational. It's the interdependence that, that was said, you know, that they really have to work together. You can't have one without the other. Can you give a particular example of bench side back to bench? Um, from bedside back to bench, so one that, that, that my group's now just getting started is we uh, have a wound healing clinic at Georgetown University Medical Center, and one of the clinicians was interested in about uh, how could you enhance the wound healing uh, activities, uh, also start looking at the microbiome that's at the wound, and so they're coming back saying, you know, we have some questions that they want to understand some of the basic science. And so you start that dialogue between the clinician who's seen problems with their patients, coming back to the scientists who can maybe help them answer some of the underlying principles. And Dr. Grider, maybe you'd like to follow on from there, the two-way street. Uh, yeah, it definitely uh, is a two-way street. Um, I certainly have um, found it very uh, exciting to see some of the work that we've done in understanding telomeres and age-related disease. Um, make it into the, uh, the, the clinical realm. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Mario Armanios, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, now sees uh, patients with these age-related diseases. Um, we thought at first that the major disease uh, due to short telomeres uh, was a bone marrow failure syndrome. Um, but by seeing these patients and going and doing the genetics in the family, what Mary recognized was these patients also had uh, something called uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. She then went on to show that, in fact, what was idiopathic, idiopathic means we don't know what causes it, that this is actually caused by short telomeres. And so uh, by seeing the patients and understanding what was going on in those families, uh, she then uh, made the hypothesis that pulmonary fibrosis is due to short telomeres. So then took that back to the lab, and we went back to our mice, and then we tested in the mice, and we could ask experiments um, why is it that there would be a lung disease associated with short telomeres? So it definitely goes in both directions. 
And uh, Dr. Watson, you were one of the first people to have your DNA sequenced. What surprises were there in your DNA? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was that, uh, uh, and it was uh, people in Craig Venter's lab, not the people in Houston. Uh, they looked at the genes coding, or variants in genes coding for uh, uh, enzymes from metabolized drugs. And uh, I have a really slow metabolizer variant, <laughs> and I'm homozygous for it, which uh, means that uh, if you'd give me, a, you know, if I'd go wacky and you gave me an antipsychotic normal dose, it probably would send me into neuroleptic malignant syndrome, one dose. So I don't have that around my wrist because I, I feel so sane. But I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. But uh, uh, you know, and I don't metabolize beta blockers. So uh, I think this is a case where we can do something now, and you don't have to sequence all the DNA. You just look at these variants, and everyone. <laughs> should be, and then it will be better utilization of drugs. So uh, and it probably you know, just takes some entrepreneurial scientist to form a company and just offer it. And then you know, the, everyone would realize they would do it. And I think if I were uh, you know, five years younger, I'd start a company. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, because uh, um, well, in fact, there are Because, you know, I really believe in it. And uh, so... In fact, there are companies like 23andMe that have started... Yeah, but they do, they're not testing. focusing on drug metabolism. And drug metabolism is just unbelievably important. Because I don't know even the range of drugs, which, you know, and who metabolizes. I don't know of any place I could get that information in a simple form. And I think all we really need is one really motivated person in need of money who just <laughs> sees a surefire way of upgrading his car. And uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so, so I'm to, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Greider how do you think genetic testing and genome sequencing is going to revolutionize medicine? Or oh, is yeah. re revolutionizing it? Yeah, I mean, it, it has, and, and what Jim was just talking about is, is exactly right. It's that um, what, what we would call individualized medicine. Uh, some people call it personal medicine, but personal to me is my diary, whereas individual is how I'm treated by my doctor. So I like to think of it as individualized medicine. Um, and, um, and I think that there is um, both uh, translational components of that now, where one can, can uh, take the information that's there and, and try and... Um, uh, direct people to you know certain drugs or not drugs or other things, but there's still a lot of basic science that needs to go on. Um, there's large amounts of um, of data that can be collected, um, and um, and to try and understand how particular diseases are associated or particular drug reactions are associated uh, in different populations. Um, of course, there are issues uh, surrounding that about uh, privacy and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, but I think it really is um, a very uh, important uh, revolution that, that is, is, is changing how um, medicine will be done. You know, I'd like to, every time I hear this word privacy, it makes me so mad that all it is is a device to keep people from finding out what it should be well, done. Well, sometimes generally, there are family generally members. Generally brought about by left-wing agitators. No, sometimes there are family members. <laughs> there may be family I, I, members I that don't want to know something. There is the thing, but it's really overrated in the sense that you can spend all your money locking up DNA records. Or, you know, but there are ways to do it that don't lock up records, and I do think that there are some considerations of, of yeah, but, family members that might not want to know but, 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 risk to some disease, those sorts of things. I think yeah, but, but when I think about it, the worst thing I did when I started the genome program was to start this ethics group. It is just, <laughs> you know, it sounds good, but if you put well, it we're into glad you practice, did it, Jim. it's a, a gigantic waste of money. And with very little benefit to anyone. So I think people should just ask yourself, what have we gained by all this talking about privacy? And, uh, well, there are you know, important policy sure, implications. Yeah, we all know if the government wants to know your DNA sequence, they're going to find it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> there's no way that we can prevent them. But uh, I just think, you know, privacy is, oh, we're moral people. I think we're just looking at the wrong thing most of the time, delaying something for six months because you have to have some group of half-brained people okay. with no particular let's experts in the subject back to getting together and making medicine. decisions. I'm just saying, how much of your money in Georgetown is wasted over privacy issues? I, I would hate to venture to answer no, no, that. No, no, I'm just I, trying to. I, I couldn't answer that. I'll, I'll just put it that way, because I really no, wouldn't. No, know, no so. but I, I'm just saying that I, I, it sounds good, but I, I've heard it now for so many years that uh, you know my DNA is out there for anyone to see. And uh, on the whole, I think I'll benefit by being free rather than locked up. And so I think a lot of this has yeah. to do with educational components as well, right. in terms of uh, educating the public about uh, what these kinds of things mean um, and educating the people that are giving the information uh, in terms of you know, really giving information that is useful information. Because you can actually do harm uh, to people uh, by, by giving out misinformation if, if we don't really know exactly what particular alleles do. Um, and so some well, amount of contemplation of these things. And, and, and to that, it's also education of the physician. Okay, let's, let's talk about education of okay. the physician and bringing well, together the scientists and physicians Because I think more. the explosion of information that was mentioned, you know, the genomics, proteomics, the metabolomics, there's so much information that's coming out there now, and the patient will be, this will become more and more available, they'll be approaching their physician and have this information. The physician has to know what to do with that. And so it's, uh, it, this is an aspect, again, of then that kind of two-way street of translational medicine, because then uh, most diseases are not a single, based on a single gene or a single protein. They're, they're aberrant pathways. And so the physicians, we're going to have to be trained now to understand the underlying no, pathways I, and, and how to mine that data and understand. No, it would be impossible to train them. You have to have a medical specialty in which the DNA sequence goes into someone who then reports to the average uh, GP, uh, yeah. I just think it's going to be so complicated that I wouldn't want to overwhelm my ordinary doctor. I, you know, I'm a good doctor, but he, he couldn't. It, 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 would, it would not be instantaneous to have this type of training. This will take a, a, clearly a period of time. No, it, it never can happen. You're well, maybe, maybe Dr. Crook, you could talk more much. about the education that you have in place at Georgetown for training the scientists and physicians, so, physicians of tomorrow. I'm it, just saying I think it has to be a specialty because of its difficulty, and you should think that, you know, that given enough time and years in grammar school, you're going to achieve it. It won't work. It's, it's, we're overwhelmed with information and, you know, how to handle it. I, I, would, I would say that they don't, you know, we all now pull out a cell phone and we know how to use the cell phone. I could not build a cell phone. I couldn't tell you the underlying principles of how the touchpad works and stuff. So it's, uh, they might not have to be the expert in how to handle this data, but at least understand the underlying principles. I, I don't think it, Well, let, let's move I, I on a little bit. I think it's a going to be bit. very complicated. And uh, we just don't realize the complexity we're getting into. That's it, all, that's it all certainly is I, incredibly I, complex. It's very complex. There's a yeah. huge amount of data. And so let's move back to the topic of translational medicine. How are we going to speed it up? Um, Carol, Dr. Grider, um, how are we going to speed up the translation of all these great discoveries into new treatments? Well, Where I mean, we I think that it gets back to what I was saying before. It's really the interplay between basic science and translational medicine. You can't on its own just speed up translational medicine. You have to have people talking to each other and, and, and new ideas come from people um, in slightly different uh, approaches to things coming together um, uh, to talk. So I think that that's what's going to be uh, really important is, is getting together uh, the people um, that, that have the idea about how to apply um, a particular um, disease approach uh, with the people that really are, are doing the basic science. Um, and that moving forward together will be the way to, uh, to move, move more quickly. And uh, Dr. Crook, how can we bring the clinicians and the basic sciences well, and the applied scientists I mean, together? Some of this is this building of ensemble or team science. Um, given, you know, some of it is how is it, how's the research get funded, you know? And so, and that can open up a whole nother 
area of discussion, but you know, are there mechanisms that help facilitate that type of ensemble science? Uh, you know, I think there's probably some great ideas out there that aren't able to get off the ground just because we haven't yet been found the best way to get them paired up together and moving forward. And I think I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Um, I'm sure there are many questions for our panelists, so I'm going to open up the floor. Please go ahead. And perhaps, in, would, can you introduce yourself? Stand up and introduce yourself. I'm interested in um, how you would describe the state of the art of understanding the processes uh, that you might be able to figure out better in an experimental setting versus a clinical setting. So is that good? I mean, computational biology is really, I mean, exploding. I mean, these, these kinds of um, really um, bringing in people who, uh, who know the informatics and, and new ways uh, to move forward and analyze the DNA is going to be absolutely um, essential uh, from what we know about um, the, the very complex interactions in, in genetics that we need to f find ways uh, to be able to um, bring those together uh, to understand disease. So I think that that is a, that is a cutting edge area um, right now in terms of computation and bringing together, uh, for instance, the students. Um, there's a number across the country, um, you know, computational biology, programs that are starting up to bring those computationally minded students together with the biologists uh, so they understand um, both sides. Um, and, and that will be the key given all this information uh, that is out there. The amount of information that we can now gather is greater than our amount, the ability to really understand it quickly. Right. Yeah, not only analyze it, but it's even to visualize it. When you start building these networks and so much of what we have is then you know two-dimensional but it's how do you how, how how can you best capture the integration of this vast wealth of data is you know one of the things that it's a section of computational biology that's going to be very important to keep uh, moving forward and dr watson did you want to add to that uh, uh, we've started a sort of department of quantitative biology at the lab uh, it's not that easy. Uh, you're generally hiring people who are trained in physics or maybe math, and uh, they don't really, you know, once they get a faculty position, necessarily have any feeling for what's an important problem. And, uh, you know, putting students on really relevant things. So, but really uh, that's the idea of bringing. Yeah, you know, no, no, but it, it's just that scientists together with the biologists, right. so they can uh, work together. But I think it's. It, 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 I I just think uh, somehow we have to make or raise the mathematical level of biologists. I don't think we can count on people trained in physics. But getting them early, I think, helps. Oh, right. uh, well, you know, I have a student in my lab who's um, at the Homewood campus of Johns Hopkins, and he's an applied math, really, really bright guy, and he came on to do a project in my lab. Um, and and um, so he's learned the biology. He already has the math as an undergraduate. And sure. so he's now learning the biology, and those are the people that then will be able to yeah. go out, and he wants to continue in his uh, area of applied yeah. math, Whether and yet you, do it in biology. Yeah. Whether you, you know, if we could look ahead and try and predict whether it's going to be the person who wanted to be a, you know, a physicist until we arrived at the university or a mathematician and then suddenly was aware of it, or whether we're going to have to get people who could have been physicists become biologists earlier in their lives and so really have a deeper feeling for what's important in biology. And I think we just have to get brighter people to go into biology. Uh, and uh, because, you know, uh, well, what, what, you know, uh, and the problem was you didn't have to be very bright to, you know, describe a new species. But uh, the, the level of knowledge. Well, I, I think we all agree we've got to get more of the young people interested in science, period, right? right? No, we've got to get more of the bright people interested in biology. <laughs> uh, and yeah, train uh, them more computationally. Right. No, no, I don't think yeah. you can train bright people. They're not training you know, they, they exist and you can use them. But it's very hard to, you know. 
you know, well, it's easy to well, say, how are we but going it, to attract it, the bright people, right? I just think there's a lot of people who, you know, very early in life, uh, see, you know, you can do mathematics at home and all that, and it's easier to do, whereas biology, uh, you, introduced later. I just think we have to, uh, the problem I see, because I'm, tr I'm trying to think through, is that, you know, we were, when we did the Human Genome Project, we all expected 100,000 genes, okay? And then this surprise, and then, you know, final relief, it's only 20,000, okay? 21,000. But 21,000 is a very big number. Uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, you know, how many characters are there in Leninger's biochemistry? <laughs> and how many of those really can you keep in your head? And uh, so metabolism is really turning out to be not, five, uh, not 50 molecules to give you a fatty acid. In some sense, it's turning out to be more like 800. Yeah. And no one has 800 friends. And so, but when you're a scientist, the, the things you deal with it are such your friends. The things you've got to manipulate, keep in your head, try and, and make sense of the sort of picture. And the number is dauntingly high. You know, we now have 500 genes at least implicated in the different forms of mental illness. And, uh, Putting that together in a, in a network is just very hard, and I, I don't know the answer, but I'm afraid that if you're going to deal with the true complexity, you can't hand it over to someone else. You've got to just decide I'm giving up any interest in baseball, and I'm focusing all my memory on this issue if I'm going to succeed. I don't Th know the answer. Thank you, Do thank you, Dr. Watson. Let's take some more questions from the audience. You stand up and introduce yourself. I'm Gil Lowen. I'm a practicing internist and have been for 40 years. And I find your comments terribly exciting. And I think of all the catastrophic events that could have been potentially avoided uh, with uh, insight into genetic uh, makeup of my patients. My question is, is, is the uh, energy that's going to go forth between the basic basic scientist and the practicing clinician. Is that getting organized to a functional level? How is this information being processed for pragmatic utilization? Yeah. So for, for the train there, I would say there is uh, an association of groups that are now starting a, a loose coalition coming together both in Europe, states, other countries as well. Um, I think the first goal is to get out there and even have folks start learning the vernacular. And so, you know, and this is, gets the idea of that, will the, you know, the, the, today the standard clinician might not pick this up quickly, but it, do we, we move folks through, through younger generations? Do we take a, a subset that maybe has the strong quantitative skills? Uh, they'll be picking up their biology and their clinical skills, and then also picking up the underlying aspects of, to allow for this individualized medicine to, to grow. And, and I think it'll be, it's an evolution over time, 15, 20 years, you know, that hopefully soon you can actually start having this become part of the curriculum for all folks going through medical school. So, you know, one way we're trying this now is we're setting up a, a, a very focused dual degree program to have some folks that are selected that have the strong quantitative background enter into this. I, the idea that we got to start getting folks trained earlier and earlier in the quantitative sciences, I think, will be important. Uh, and so, you know, I, it, it's going to take a period of time. But there is now some communications going on of groups uh, around the world trying to develop and trying to come up with some kind of what would be the standards, what, how would we assess this, how would we move forward? Okay, more questions. My name is Pierre Cartier. I'm a practicing dentist. In addition, I am a Master of Public Health student at the George Washington University. Um, in recent years or recent months, we've had the issue of uh, lack of funding for science due to the government shutdown and various fiscal failures. And that's sending a very discouraging um, set of values through the science community right now. I'm interested in doing research in my career, but a lot of people in the profession are discouraging me from doing that, telling me that the opportunities are limited. And I was wondering, um, 
what kind of concerns do you have about um, encouraging younger people or even people like me that have done the clinical work and want to begin going into science? Um, what kind of concerns do you have um, for getting us engaged in, in this current environment? Yeah, this is something that I worry about um, all of the time, and uh, it kind of gets back also to the uh, thing that Jim was talking about, is getting um, really bright people to come into the field. And um, what we're doing right now is we are really discouraging uh, young scientists. Um, it is extremely difficult um, in this current environment uh, to get a research grant. Um, I was on a panel um, last week at the, or uh, two weeks ago, at the National Press Club with the American Society for Cell Biology, and we had a number of, of speakers there uh, talking about this issue about um, uh, the current uh, age at getting a first uh, R01 grant, which is a, an individual research grant, and it's gone up to now I think 44 or 46 years old, um, which you know is is just remarkable. I mean, when I was doing uh, my work on the discovery um, of telomerase, my my first grant, I was able to to get my first grant, and at that time, I think the percentile was around in the 30s that the 30th percentile was funded, and now it's less than 11 at some institutes. So I probably wouldn't have gotten that grant. And this is uh, discouraging uh, young people from going into science. And so if we want to bring those brightest minds in and do that translational uh, component, um, we, we really have to find a way uh, to support uh, the young scientists, because that's what's going to bring uh, the, the new uh, uh, the new ideas uh, in, and um, and so you know, if there is some way to be able to um, uh, get um, more support for for that kind of um, science, that's really going to be the only way. And 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 these um, people starting out are what's going to do the translational medicine yeah. of the future. Yeah, it's 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 the pipeline for the next generation, and it's exactly, folks are getting discouraged. Um, so not only is it unfortunately discouraging for folks to get into that who should be getting into it and have the ability to do well if they're into it. Um, we're also losing some good science. You, the, the, these grants are peer reviewed. You sit on panels and you see some very good science that's just not able to be funded. And you, you wonder, it, it doesn't take very long for a productive research program to wind down due to lack of funding. And to get something up and going is, is taking a long time. And so it, it's, 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 a, it's a tough situation we're facing. And how can we get the government more interested in science and in funding science and explain to them the importance <laughs> of, of science and how it drives innovation? Well, it's well, not just innovation, but it is an economic driver as oh, yeah. well. I mean, if you read some of these, these reports about the innovation in the U.S. and, and the amount of uh, dollars that, that that brought into the economy, it's not just about being able to keep the cutting edge, it's, it's a, an, an economic uh, driver. And the amount of money that went into the Human Genome Project from the, um, uh, the, the, the government side, um, there was a hundredfold return on that in terms of the companies that were started and all of the, uh, the other spin-offs. Um, and so um, there's actually a reason uh, to do it from an economic standpoint, sure. not just from those of us that, that are doing the science. It, huge economic engine for, where, for the economy of the advances that can be that when someone is starting off, they're just looking perhaps not even at translational, but just some fundamental question that it's very hard to predict what the implications could be downstream, but they can be very profound scientifically and economically. Um, do we need a space race, sort of a moonshot for translational medicine? Or for science, scientific research in general? Some big project that's going to unite everyone and get everyone excited. And I think that where all the fundamental discoveries have really come from is from individuals following their curiosity. And then those discoveries, those you know, individual um, nuggets of information are what are then translated. Um, I think a lot of funds have gone into you know, a particular um, focused area. Um, you know, for instance, what, what I work on, you know, the people that have been studying um, pulmonary fibrosis were never thinking about telomeres. And so any money that would go into funding pulmonary fibrosis would have nothing to do with, you know, the fundamental underlying cell uh, biology issues. So just targeting particular areas isn't necessarily where the breakthroughs in those areas will come from. Um, so, um, so I certainly don't think that we need any, you know, big overarching um, uh, space new space. approach, but we need to understand uh, that uh, the, the general young scientists need to be supported to be able to, you don't know where those discoveries are going to come from. And they will come. Right. 
Are, 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 I'm surprised, Dr. Watson, you're being, I know you're passionate about this. <laughs> Dr. Watson, do you have any thoughts um, on, on a space race for science? I think the, <laughs> the real problem is not lack of money, but lack of brains. That's just my <laughs> own, uh, it's a, uh, you know, not popular opinion. Uh, I don't think if we double the money for cancer research, we'll get a cure any twice as fast. Uh, I think it's just eaten into the system of inefficiency. And that, uh, and I don't know the answer, but full-blown democracy uh, doesn't really work with the elitism of science. And, uh, you know, if you took the, uh, the $30 billion NIH budget, I suspect you could cut out 10 billion as just being totally going nowhere. But yet there are examples. No, the, there are, but I'm trying yeah. to say in America's that war on in cancer, many, uh, you really know, the hard yielded. business world, unless you produce a result, you uh, essentially wither away. And we're very protective in science uh, of trying to, to keep everyone in the game, but then it's reducing the amount per person and I, 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 the I don't know. The young people aren't in the game. Yeah, <laughs> that's, it's, 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 it's getting the young people into this. No, no, that's a but, big but issue. I, I do think the scientific community has to realize, one, <laughs> that we'd probably be getting a lot more money if we'd cured cancer. There's a lot of cynicism over the right. That the number of people dying from cancer in the United States today is exactly the same that died when Nixon declared war on cancer. We've made progress in some, but uh, in others, uh, not at all. And, uh, but survival and quality of life have increased well, for cancer patients. No, I mean, all, all we've done is created a giant industry of not very well treating people with cancer. And it's a drain on our country. <laughs> now that is, you know, you could, an unpopular viewpoint. Why I haven't been invited back to Washington for 15 years? <laughs> and, and they don't want to be. Not where we are now. <laughs> no, 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 there we are. no, no. It's it's true. But you know, Bert Vogelstein showed this slide. It, it was pretty devastating. And you know, diabetes is coming up. It's now one third of cancer, and it's going up fast. Uh, I think we. <laughs> You know, if, if we are a profession to survive, we've got to succeed a lot more in translational things, which directly impact the company. And, you know, a group of pure scientists by ourselves, we're pretty awkward. We're not, you know, we're not very lovable because of our focus on what we're doing. And so all they can see us is by our results. And uh, so... Uh, well, let, let's take I, some more. No, no, but I, I'm trying to, to, to indicate that uh, some of the things are hard, but, you know, I, you know, decided to save the Cold Spring Harbor Lab because of, of going into cancer research because I thought there was money for it, all right? Now he's interested in it. But I think we've got to ask, what does the country need to be done as fast as possible and do it? Rather than trying to maintain our societies and everyone, we never ask that question. We just sort of assume that God is going to continue to give us money. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, it doesn't seem like it at the moment with the sequester, but we have an, another question. Former graduate of uh, Georgetown University in biomedical science policy and advocacy program. It's a program that basically tells us how to lobby for scientists. The scientists are not vocal enough. They stay in their labs, do their research, but they don't go out to members of Congress or agencies to advocate for themselves. Is there, you think, one reason that science funding is declining, that we're just not being vocal enough like defense contractors or medical device companies or drug companies? I think that there is a fair amount of advocacy. As I mentioned, uh, I was uh, on a panel with the uh, American Society for Cell Biology. There are a number of societies that, that do go out um, and advocate. Um, you're, you're right, uh, the general scientist uh, in their laboratory um, sometimes doesn't know what specifically it is that they can do uh, to advocate. Um, and so that's why working through uh, these societies, uh, there are, are channels uh, to be able to um, uh, use your efforts uh, to uh, make people aware and uh, 
educate the public and and they also encourage people just to talk to their neighbors about what they're doing and talk to the you know the people that they that they meet at, at uh, parties and things just to, to talk more about what they do about science just so that people understand what it's about I think you're asking too much of the ordinary person I think the only thing they can understand is a sock vaccine that's just my own thing, you know. <laughs> and we have to produce the equivalent of another soft vaccine soon, if we're going to be viable. Okay, uh, there was another hand up right at the back there. I'm with the U.S. Department of Education, and I work in some STEM programs. Would um, now the panelists um, up there, would you agree that it takes an incredible amount of patience to get results? It's that no matter how brainy you are, I mean, a, whatever it is, nature and God and chemistry and biochemistry and physics, the way they interact, you can only get results so fast. Not everything yes. can be a catalyst. Yes, this depends, of course, on, on, on the field. Uh, different fields are different. If you're talking about um, experimental uh, biology, uh, where you have to go in and set up a particular research experiment, um, that can take longer than if you were handed data and you had a computational problem uh, to solve. So there is a, a wide variety of different kinds of training. Uh, but I do think that there is um, a lot of training for people um, uh, in the STEM education, um, where you can go into laboratories Many laboratories at Johns Hopkins have um, high school students or um, undergraduate students who will come in and do projects for a whole year. Um, and, and that's the kind of training. They come three or four days um, a week, and, and they can get uh, projects done. And that's how we try and excite the young people about what it is that it is to do discovery, because that's what will bring people yeah. into, uh, into science, is to get that spark of finding out something new that nobody else knows. And that's just so exciting. And so if it takes a little bit of time, um, there are programs that allow students to really experience that. And I think that that's what will draw them right. in. And, and, and it's a passion. I mean, you might have a high school student or an undergrad. Maybe you're giving some lecture-based course. And they sometimes, and they'll come and say, that was really fascinating. And they don't maybe stop and realize that in that 50-minute lecture, how many hours and days and years of work went into that. But then they get into the lab. But it's a different thing. It's exactly what Carol said. You're you're seeing something for the very first time. So I think, yes, there has to be persistence and there has to be the underlying passion to, to want to do that. But there, and it's, it's incumbent upon us to kind of ignite that, or, you know, spark so that they have that passion and they see and they, they experience it and then want to keep pursuing that. Okay, and uh, gentleman at the back. Hello, my name is Tino Dai. I work at the Library of Congress. Is there any kind of professional slash amateur cooperation that is going on, you know, so that even though, uh, you know, I, I don't have, you know, the bi biological training or the, or the med uh, medical training, I can still pursue these things uh, even though I work at the Library of Congress. Well, I know of some, uh, some examples where uh, people uh, basically crowdsource problem solving. Um, so there are some uh, problems, for instance, I'm thinking of a, of a group that do uh, protein folding. Um, and uh, what they do is they put out on the web and they say, you know, here are some little problems. And they have a lot of people work on the little components. And people just do it on the side. Um, and by uh, then basically crowdsourcing the information, they can sometimes solve problems that way by having you know, a bunch of people that are just curious um, put their mind to it. So, so there are those kinds of um, programs that are out there. And so my, actually my question is, is there a thrust in, you know, in, like for instance, uh, this gentleman's from Georgetown, um, is there a thrust to actually uh, um, to actually have this uh, be more widespread rather than a one-shot uh, one uh, crowdsourcing type of effort. I mean, I, I would think not just unique to Georgetown. One of the other things that's out there is the whole idea of MOOCs. And do you start putting out these very large, you know, out to the world type of ways of getting information out, have folks participate as they want to see fit. And that, that's such a new field. It'll be very interesting to see where that ends up. You know, it's something that 
yeah, or, or, uh, multi, or uh, massive. massive online or, 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 open course. Open, open course. course. Oh, yeah, it's okay. So it's, Look, it's online the, learning. Online learning. It's the idea that you just put it out there for no fee, basically for anyone to learn. Uh, some folks are trying to say, do you want to do it as you know a course that leads to a degree or not? I mean, it's it's still very nascent in how different groups are doing. It. There's. Uh, most institutions across the country are now starting to develop MOOCs and put them out there. And it'll, I think that might, it'll be interesting to see over time where that leads for the, some of the things that you're asking as well. Okay, we have a few minutes left. So any last questions? Gentleman at the back here. My name is Mohamed Sisi and I'm a mathematics professor. I share several of the sentiments that Dr. Watson has expressed. And I think I can, I, I can tell you where you can find those bright people that will do the research, they're in math departments, <laughs> and the <laughs> physics departments that do research, just pure research. They don't care about applications. I think, you know, I think you should be talking to them. I think you should talk to your, your colleagues in the math department. And this theoretical, I'm a pure mathematician, and you know, I do pure research, and you were trained. I went to MIT, and then you're trained, you think theoretically. You don't care about applications. Everything is purely abstract. That's how you get your guys, your bright guys. I think these people need to be recruited to get involved in applied research. So, there you go. <laughs> I, I think the gentleman was uh, indicating it where you can get the brightest minds from, I believe, from mathematics departments, yeah. you were saying? <laughs> and MIT. <laughs> <laughs> mathematics departments. Mathematics departments at universities. Uh, you know. <laughs> because right now, I mean, but that's why you have the very bright guys who right now that just do pure research. Without any, they don't even want to do anything, uh, you know, applied. In fact, people that do applied are looked down on. We have applied mathematics. I'm a pure mathematician. I do extremely theoretical, abstract stuff. So, but so I'm also interested in applications. So I do applications. I do DNA. I do, um, I do theoretical physics. I do, but I, I do applied. So I'm interested in that. But most Mathematicians do just pure research, and they don't care about applications. But I think that's where the bright guys are. They're the ones that are really very so, bright. So the bright guys yes. and, go and girls <laughs> are in the mathematics department. The point I'm trying to get across yeah. is I think some of our brightest minds should be now more focusing on major translational problems which our country has to solve in order to stay solvent and uh, harmonious. And uh, we, there seems to be no sense of duty in the community that they actually have to worry about what the, the country needs to be solved. There's not the slightest wartime atmosphere in our country. And that, and yet we have, you know, overwhelmed by dementia. The largest single cause of personal bankruptcy is taking care of Alzheimer's parents. But the you US know. has just announced the big Alzheimer's initiative to try and put more money in, into I, I haven't research. seen it. Money is not the solution. It's bright people. And Alzheimer's field has not been dominated by bright people. Neurologists. Come on. Money, will, <laughs> money can help bring bright people into a field. No, that, that's what Absolutely. I'm trying to say. Is that I would agree with that. These traditional fields have been ones where you do not have to be uh, complicated science. And, and suddenly, uh, they're faced with, you know, should you give a neurology department all the money for Alzheimer's? No. <laughs> and, well, it's not just uh, neurologists. It's, it's all the people working on basic neurodegenerative um, yeah, but, but uh, well. uh, look, they're not the same quality as the people who built the atomic bomb. That's all I'm trying to say. And I think our country has to face up to how difficult these problems are. Well, I, th they, I think you, really you, you do this through translational. You start bringing together the ensemble. Yeah, the I'm just saying but I agree. You said uh, there has you to be the some there, the people will be sense there. of where people, that, you know, they could spend all their time being a clever chemist. But maybe 
they're really going to have to, to get it into a field. Uh, the Alzheimer's field has made no progress in 10 years. It's also an enormously complex disease. I, I know, but uh, you know, how many more personal bankruptcies? You know, these are just awful things. You know, of, uh, I think we would all agree it's levels. a horrible disease. And uh, so I'm just saying, <laughs> uh, I, I submitted my first paper in translational medicine. Today, yesterday, and uh, did you send it to science translational medicine? No, no, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I want to have an impact. I sent. It to oh. We are a brand new <laughs> journal. No, we have a no, good no, impact I said, factor. I <laughs> No, you I sent just, it to the Lancet. Yes, okay. That's all I'm trying to say. It's in diabetes. I wanted to read by people in the field. Uh, I have Stephen O'Reilly read it. And he himself, he, because it's you know outside my expertise. But you know, it could be the second most important paper I've ever published. Because I, I should I've, look out for it, what? and uh, I look forward to reading it. Yeah, but in <laughs> any case, you know, it's partly my age. You know, I don't want to. I want to go on until I'm 90. I don't want to get Alzheimer's. Well, <laughs> and uh, so I have a sense of urgency, but I think even younger people have got to just look at the statistics and where the money is being consumed. And it's consuming, it's I taking money away from our science. You know, <laughs> everyone is being squeezed by these unpleasant it's medical costs. And uh, we shouldn't, you know, we could be much, Tim O'Neill could be a nicer, you know, get along 20 years ago, but he didn't have the budget problems we have today. Well, I think we'd all agree with that. Last final comments from our other panelists, Dr. Greider. Yeah, I just think that um, the, the, the main point about getting young people excited in making discovery is where a, a lot of the new things will come from. And, and translational medicine uh, comes directly on top of those fundamental discoveries. And so, uh, you know, encouraging uh, the young people and making the field um, palatable um, is really where the change is going to come. And do Dr. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and just to add to that, I think in translational sciences, these devastating diseases that Jim's mentioned, Alzheimer's, obesity, I mean, there will be applications for this. If we get the young folks into this and start working on, a, on addressing these problems from the basic to, to the clinic, I think, you know, hopefully we'll have some impact. I think it's a big hole which could be filled. Uh, I, I would agree with that, a big no. hole that needs to be filled. And I think on that note, we're going to close the panel. I'm going to thank our three wonderful panelists and the audience. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.